Hello, and welcome to the series where I do stuff to a thing. In the past couple episodes, I talked about how I used stack blasting to win back some of the speed that I lost when I moved to off-screen buffering. But there's one other thing that I did that I didn't talk about, and that is self-modifying code. Today we're going to talk about what I did and how I did it, and most importantly, why would anyone... In the last couple of videos, I talked about how I use stack blasting to very quickly copy the mountains onto the screen for each frame. And I talked about how I had to store them upside down and partially unreversed. And then in order to scroll them, I would have to take my offset, start at the very end, or rather beginning of the last octet and move it forward and then move it to the previous octet at the beginning here and then move it forward. And that would be the process. It was kind of crazy and complicated, but it did the trick. I also talked about how there were all these special cases, like what if my offset is in the middle of an octet? What if it is at the very beginning or the end of an octet? And exactly how many octets need to be copied in each phase? I would always start at the leftmost octet, since that's the end, and I would move forward, which is backward, until I got to the octet containing the offset, but then I would have to skip ahead of the offset and then move forward through that octet. And then for the second half of the screen, starting here, I would have to do the portion to the left of the octet and then the other octets after it, because of course they come before it. If that made no sense to you, join the club. I don't think I understand what I said either. One of the issues I ran into though is how do I deal with all of these special cases in a way that would be efficient? Here's where you really want to be. These two lines will pull and push eight bytes at a time. So if I could just keep on doing this over and over and over again, S will advance for me, U will advance for me, and everything is super efficient. But this is only going to work when I want to copy the entire octet. What if I only need to copy three bytes or four bytes? Well, I do have this routine here, copy up to eight bytes. And it has all these cases, depending on what you want to copy, it will choose the register set to ensure you copy the correct number of bytes. So eight, seven, six, and so on. On entry to the function, it assumes that B will contain the number of bytes to copy. And then I use B to index into a jump table. And the jump table simply has the labels of the different routines to copy. So for example, if B were three, we would index here and we would just copy three. You'll notice by the way, rather than returning, we do a jump to an address that has been saved for us. The reason is, remember with stack blasting, I am using the S register for my own evil purposes. So I cannot be doing any BSR and RTSing. So I have to branch into here and it has to jump back out. But let's focus on this code here. How much am I spending to use that jump table? Here are the cycle counts on the left. In order to prepare for the jump table, we're using six cycles. And then to actually index into the jump table, another seven cycles. We're doing indirect, indexed, extended, whatever, all the addressing modes, all in one, all in one go. The insight to make here is that we're spending these cycles on every horizontal line because the number of bytes we need to copy for this partial octet remains the same for each line. And yet we're doing this work over and over again for each line. And that's not all. What does it take just to prepare to branch to copy up to eight bytes? Remember, we can't do RTSs, so we actually have to set aside what the return address is gonna be. We're gonna load it into a register, and then we're gonna store it into that location so that it can go there to return. That's another nine cycles before we can even branch there. And again, that's for every line. So here's another way to go. Imagine you just have a couple lines of code for each possibility, copying eight, copying seven, copying six. You have your pull and your push, and then you jump out of there. 
Obviously, we don't want to jump to zero, but we're putting this in here so that we can modify it later. We can stamp it with where we want to jump back to. And notice, this is just regular direct extended addressing, no indexed, not indirect. So what we need is for code to know where it needs to jump to. So if we know we only need to copy three bytes, our code will need to know to directly jump here, and then it will need to make sure that that helps it to jump back. Like before, we are going to have a jump table. So depending how many bytes we want, we're going to be using this to go and fetch what the addresses are for where we're going to jump to. And then this is the address of where we need to stamp our return. So for example, copy three ret is the label right above that jump. This is going to be one byte. And so if we add one to this label, we're going to be pointing at that address that we're going to return back to. And that's why we have a plus one over here. So we do have a jump table. We are going to have to index into it, but we're only going to have to do it once per time that we need to copy the mountains over. Not once per line, but once for the entire copy of the entire rectangle. So all the stack blasting is happening in this routine copy rectangle. I'm not going to be going through all of the code, but I do want to point out that before we start looping, we will initialize all of those jump addresses. So we'll point into that jump table. We'll figure out how many bytes we need to copy for that partial octet. And then down here, the resulting address that we'll need to jump to, we store here. So let's take a look at that. Copy bytes jump high is the jump to go to the routine that copies the partial number of bytes. And once again, it's a simple jump to zero. And we're just going to add one to that label to get to the address and then store the address from the jump table there. Once everything is initialized, then we can start our loop. And then we can do line by line by line and we don't have to recalculate where to jump to to copy the bytes and where to jump back to when we're done because we did that before the loop started. Now each jump is only four cycles. So jumping to those lines and then jumping back, each is gonna be four cycles. Compare that with three plus six plus three, that's 12 cycles to get there. And then another four plus two plus seven, that's another 13 cycles to jump our way to the actual copy and code. There is some work we have to do up front before the loop to get all of those jumps stamped properly. And that is 32 cycles. That's not nothing. But the fact that we only have to do that once and not 33 times, because there are 33 lines, is a huge savings. And we pass that savings on to the game player. And so this is what we have after all the stack blasting and the self-modifying code. And it looks like my speed is back up to the pre-off-screen buffer speed. Now I do still have to add things like the car with the rotating wheels and the alien and the scoring. I don't think they're going to slow things down too much. So I think actually the speed is pretty good. But keep in mind that the re one of the reasons I went to off-screen buffering was to try to minimize tearing so that everything would kind of flash at once. And did I really minimize tearing? If you look at the mountains, it kind of looks like sometimes I'm looking at more than one frame at a time. And especially if you look at the bottom, if you look at the ground, especially those mile markers, it looks like they come in pairs rather than one at a time. Now maybe this is just some kind of illusion or maybe it's like some kind of Windows drawing thing. So one thing I can do is use a nifty feature on the MAME debugger. There's a little command here called run until next interrupt on the CPU. And what it'll do is it'll break the next time an interrupt happens and it ends up here at 10C. Now, I will be talking more about interrupts in a future video, but for now, the main thing to keep in mind is the interrupt that we're going to encounter is the field sync interrupt, and that should happen after a full frame has been drawn on the screen. So then I can look at the screen and ask myself, do I really see double of anything? And it actually looks pretty good. And I can advance to the next frame. And oh, oh, look at that. We got like uh, a break here in the mile markers. Let's advance to the next frame. Now those are fixed. Interestingly, nothing happened. Now the ground moved. You'll expect the ground to move every frame and the mountains to move every third frame because of the parallax. 
most of the time, this is looking pretty good. But we did encounter an issue. Oh, I don't know if you just saw that, but the mountains just kind of separated. I went kind of fast through that. All right. Uh, but let's not get too anxious too quickly. Another nice feature on the debugger is it tells you where the beam on your CRT is. So it tells you the X location and the Y location. I'm expecting the Y location to be at the bottom of the frame every time. Keep your eye on beam Y as I advance to the next frame. It's all over the place. What's going on? Maybe I'm not really even looking at reality. How do I know what I'm seeing? Am I really seeing tearing or am I just seeing an artifact of some bug in MAME? Well, as it turns out, there is a bug in MAME and I've been spending a lot of time recently looking into the MAME source code and seeing if I can fix it. So I'm going to be taking a break from this series and instead you can expect to see some videos that talk about other things like MAME and this bug and what the heck's going on? Because I need this fixed before I can continue with my game.